All right, good morning, everybody. So nice to see you on this last Parsha for the year um, of 5781. What a year. We will start with our blessing. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Bachar Banu Mikol Hamim Vinatan Lanu Et Torato Baruch Ata Adonai Noten HaTorah Excuse me. Just want to share with you that I am so grateful to Hashem, so grateful to my daughter-in-law and my son. We got our permission, our Ishur, to enter Israel this morning, and it was people who have not even heard back and had to cancel trips, and our daughter-in-law submitted it through the um, interior ministry in Israel. And it happens to be that where they live is a ministry that is maybe the office isn't so as busy, but we were really down to the wire because there were only um, like five work days left between now and when we would be leaving. And um, she heard within 45 minutes and they got right back to her and got, gave us the permission. So we're very excited. So I wanted to share that with you. It was, my stomach has been in knots and, uh, yeah, so Bezrat Hashem will stay well and everything will be okay. And then we'll see what happens afterwards. Helene, I see you just unmuted. I so. just came, so what did I miss? I must have missed something. Oh, very we got our Ishur, our permission to enter Israel this morning. And for the trip? It's been um, for our for Steve's and my trip as a visiting a first- Oh, for the trip, but not for ours yet. Not ours yet. So that's a- different category so we are i'm monitoring that like five times a day i'm telling you i'm on the news paying yeah, attention sure. to that okay so but they've been inundated with requests yeah. so yeah. it's uh, we've had people we've had family who um never heard back from the ministry and had to cancel their trip because they never got permission to go in so mm. getting it was um very exciting so i'm, yeah. share that with you. I'm very happy now my stomach can yeah. Very happy for you. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. We're very, very <laughs> excited. <laughs> it's yeah. so what is was the, that, Gabby? When is the baby due? Uh, um, <laughs> like, like at Yom Kippur, Sukkot. Yeah, because when you are, so this is interesting, Halakha, if you are well, if you are in your ninth month of pregnancy, you fast on Yom Kippur. Um, which can trigger labor and delivery, but at the ninth <gasps> month, it's not considered, it will not harm the baby. She'll be in bed, she'll stay in bed. It's not like she's gonna go stand at shul, but she'll be in bed and fast. So it's very possible that could trigger. Um, if not, she's due like around sukkahs. So um, we're renting a, a, an apartment in Jerusalem. Yeah. Just a, um, what's it called? Well, I, told her, um, I told her I would call her. Um, I, I it now before they can it slate in Israel. So that it would, um, a, what's it called? A studio, but it's on the ground level and they're going to build a sukkah for us. So we'll have a sukkah, a lulav and etrog, and we'll be, we'll be in, um, in quarantine for the week of sukkahs because we arrive on Arab sukkahs. So we will, it'll be very different experience, but we're excited. How long will you yes, stay there, Ellen? In Israel, either yeah. three weeks or five weeks. Mm -hmm. I won't know until after <laughs> we get there. <laughs> yes, Daisy. Two things. One is my mother fasted for Yom Kippur and I was born the next morning. There you <laughs> go. So All right. Just, just wanted to share. And other, uh, the other thing is I need to leave a few minutes before. So I just wanted to let you know. And Shanat, wanted to wish Shana Tova to everybody. Thank you so much, Daisy. Thank to you. To you too, much. Daisy. Lots of love. Thank you. Bye -bye. All right, let's go ahead and begin. I'm so excited to be with you here um, for this last um, Parsha. And it's very interesting. The Parsha that we are on is Parsha Nitzavim. The insights from here come from a class from Rabbi Mordechai Satorsky and others, but pr primarily him. So Parsha Nitzavim, which is on page 1087, if you have the blue um, Chumash, or chapter 29, verse 9, if you have some other source of Deuteronomy. Parsha Nitzavim is always read before Rosh Hashanah. Often it is 
put together, usually it is put together with the Parsha that comes afterwards, which is Vayelech. So usually it's Nitzavim Vayelech. And unlike other Parshas that are combined occasionally, but sometimes are apart, they're considered two separate Parshas and put together. Nitzavim and Vayelech are actually considered one Parsha that are sometimes divided. And this year is one of those cases where it's divided because we need an extra Parsha because the way the calendar works out uh, that we need something, we're, we we can't finish the Torah too soon. So we have to, can't finish it before Simchas Torah. So they they divide up Nitzavim and Vayelech. But what we're going to look at is that the Parsha of Nitzavim is also understood to be a reference to Rosh Hashanah. So let's take a look and see why that is in, in a number of cases. So it starts out, Atem Nitzavim Hayom Kulchem Lifnei Hashem Orokechem. You are standing today, all of you before Hashem, your God. And then it goes in to say who all is standing there, which is basically everybody from men, women, children, top of the social ladder, down to the bottom of the social ladder, everybody is included there. And the question is why? Why are all these people standing there? So we learned that this day, when it says today, that you are all standing there today, that that today was the last day of Moshe Rabbeinu's life, that we are on the seventh of Adar and that he is going to be passing away on this day. So this is either, I take that back, it's either the day that he's going to be dying that day, I'm not sure what time of day he dies on the seventh, but anyway, it's considered to be the seventh of Adar, his last day. So it's interesting that the nexus point between his last day and then Joshua taking over for the new regime, the new change, the new leadership is going to be Joshua. It's also understood, even though we know that on the calendar, it's the seventh of Adar, which is in the spring and has nothing to do with Rosh Hashanah. Our sages still say yes and when it says Hayom, that it's referring to Rosh Hashanah. So don't try to exactly figure that out in your head because it's, those puzzle pieces don't feel like they go together. But that Hayom today is also understood to be Rosh Hashanah, that that's what it's referring to, that it's referring to a Rosh Hashanah. And on some, in some ways we can understand it is a Rosh Hashanah because we have other Rosh Hashanahs in the Torah. We have Rosh Hashanahs, we have the Rosh Hashanah of Tu B'Shvat, which is the Rosh Hashanah for trees. We have the Rosh Hashanah of Nisan is a Rosh Hashanah for the counting of kings and what their reign is, their rulership. So we have different Rosh Hashanahs. So we're saying that this is a Rosh Hashanah, meaning that this is going to be a change of new leadership of the passing of the torch from Moshe to Joshua. And that we too, in our Rosh Hashanah, it's a Rosh Hashanah for us, the actual Rosh Hashanah coming up is a Rosh Hashanah of a new year, of the new possibilities, the new potential, and that we stand at this nexus point. And that this point is very bittersweet as it obviously is for the Jewish people. I mean, if I was tend to think about it from Moshe's perspective that he's getting ready to pass away, but from the Jewish people's perspective, they're going to mourn Moshe for 30 days and they're not going to go into the land of Israel immediately, but they are basically going to be transitioning and moving to a new direction. They're going into the land of Israel. They're gonna have the new leader of Joshua everything is going to be different for them. So standing on this point, it's a, you don't want to exactly say a precipice because that makes it sound like you're going to fall in and that's not good, but they're definitely standing at a nexus point. They are standing at a nexus point and that that's what we are for this week. This Shabbos is the Shabbos that is right before Rosh Hashanah and we are also at this nexus point. In addition, Oh, sorry. Hold on a second. I just, I think you can hear me, but I lost us. What did I click on? I don't know. Can you all hear me? If somebody can say something. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. So I have to figure out what I need to click on to get back to you, but I don't see it. That's very weird. Okay. Where's my zoom? Um, we can see you and we can hear you. You can see me and hear me. And that's everything, at least from my point of view, everything looks normal. Okay, that's so weird. Okay, I'm gonna to try to find us. I don't recognize any of these icons down here. Um, let me see if I can find you. Okay, I'm gonna, 
keep talking as if I can see you. Okay, and hopefully I figure out if somebody can tell me how to get back, that would be amazing. Um, okay, that's so weird. Oh, I like uh, to see your face. We hear you and we see you. Okay. What does your screen look like? It says, um, experience the power of pro annual Zoom post attendee. Okay, I'm just gonna click on this and see what happens. If I come out, I will come back in, okay? Okay. All right, um, sorry about this. Um, I don't know what to do. You're still here. Oh, okay. You You're here. You. You're good. Okay. It's so You're weird. Good. All right. I'm just going to pretend I see you. Um, okay. okay. Let me think, yeah. rewind my mind a moment for what I was going to say. Oh, this Shabbos is normally this Shabbos because it's the Shabbos before Rosh Chodesh because the month of Tishrei is really a Rosh Chodesh. It's when Rosh Hashanah really is Rosh Chodesh, but we don't announce it. We don't announce the and bless the new month for the upcoming month of Tishrei. We don't announce it. We don't bless it. And on Rosh Hashanah, we don't refer to the fact that it's Rosh Chodesh as well. It's we focus on the new year, not the fact that it's a new month, which is just kind of interesting. So this is a very powerful Shabbos. The other thing that today is, today is the 25th of Elul. The 25th of Elul is really the day that God started creation. So when we celebrate Rosh Hashanah, we are celebrating the creation of humanity. We are not celebrating in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. That's today. So there is a tradition for people to read, go back to Genesis, go back to Bereshit, and each day from like starting today until we get to the sixth day, which will be Rosh Hashanah, there is an idea about reading that little paragraph about what was created on that day. So today is the 25th of Elul. That is the, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth and the creation of light was also on this day. And, the, and it was morning, it was evening, the first day. So we go back to this and we are in a, a complete, talk about a factory reset. This is a factory reset. So it's interesting because when we re, begin to read the Torah again, which is on Simplus Torah, and we have Parsha Bereshit, that's when we usually read that section of the Torah. But this is saying, we're talking about an actual reliving and commemoration of the period of time. That's now. That is really actually right now. So if you have a Chumash, or you can look it up online even, and just read today's reading of, and you know, we'll do it together here. Um, I'll read it for us. Today is... In the beginning of God's creating the heavens and earth, when the earth was astonishingly empty with darkness upon the surface of the deep and the divine presence hovered upon the surface of the waters, God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good and God separated between the light and the darkness. God called to the light day and to the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning one day. So that is today's reading pretty short but everything is in there that's the actual beginning of time okay so having that in mind and then the sixth day will be the creation of humanity and um, that is the, the most important day because all of creation is important but it mostly makes a difference for when the, we are going to be created the people who are going to use the world that's when the world takes on meaning so we have that it's going to be Rosh Chodesh, the announcement of the new month, that we're actually in creation. This is a very special, special week. There's also an, an additional layer of teshuva that today is the first day that this is a, and a, we can atone and do teshuva for all the first days, all the day ones of the week of creation, then day two, day three, day four, day five, day six. So that is that, that structure there. Going back to Atem Nitzavim, that word Nitzavim, and we talked about okay. um, She has a case button that she's doing right now. Um, I can't, um, because I can't see you, I can't mute you, but if, if whoever um, is unmuted, if you wouldn't mind muting yourself, that would be helpful. Thank you. Um, okay, Atem Nitzavim, you are all standing. 
We talked about this on Tuesday. For So for anybody who was with us for Tuesday, we're going to talk about it a little bit, but from a different perspective. The word nitzavim means to stand, but it's not just standing. It means standing and not falling over. So there are three different words for standing. One you'll recognize from the word amida, the standing prayer, which is the Shemona Esrei that we stand for. The reason it's called the amida is because la amod means to stand. Then there is another word which also means to stand or to get up, and that's la kum, okay? Kumi ori, so like to get, to get up my light. Lakum is another kind of standing. And then there is the word that is the root of nitzavim. That in it almost sounds much more stable, okay? It's down, it sounds stable. It's related to the word matseva, which is a headstone that is solid and stands guard over the place where the body and the neshama have a nexus point. And so that is a, a, matza, a matseva, and that's related to the word nitzavim. So you are all standing. What's really interesting is that this has to do with standing in a certain way. And I would say it's like standing with confidence, standing with a sense of stability and security and optimism. And I would say bordering on chutzpah standing, but not necessarily. So this is interesting because we have a bit of a paradox about standing with confidence. We're getting ready for Rosh Hashanah. Right. If you were getting ready to go to trial and you have to defend your life and the choices that you've made, I don't know, it could give your stomach a little bit of the butterflies. I'm not sure that we would necessarily go into the courtroom with a sense of I'm standing here feeling confident and a little bit of chutzpah. You're coming in front of the judge. You might think that there would be a different approach that should be taken, like a little bit more humble and bent over and maybe a little bit, I don't know what the word is, but uh, a little bit of contrition, um, something like that. That's not like, so I'm standing like this. There's also an idea that we say that, the, that our great Torah scholars that there's a whole idea to not stand like that. It's that you're not supposed to stand in a way that is haughty. Um, in fact, the Kohen Gadol wore a, uh, the, like a crown on his head that said, Holy Tashem. And it says it was specifically to remind him to be careful to not get carried away with himself. That he's the Kohen Gadol, he's the high priest, He's dressed in all this finery. You could, it could literally go to your head. And that this is to protect against that. So we have an idea and you'll often see pictures of great rabbis. And there's even a little bit of a stereotype of a yeshiva bocher standing a little bit hunched over. That that's not just poor posture from being over the books. That there's an idea that one should stand with a little bit of humility. We know on Yom Kippur when we say the al chait. When we confess our sins, it specifically in the direction says, we say this with a bent from a bent position. Even the shape of the shofar is supposed to be bent because it's looking to create the feeling of like, I'm not feeling so confident about myself. I don't, I don't have that much chutzpah. And yet on the other hand, we have this nitzavim of standing there with borderline chutzpah. So what is all of that about? So we're going to explore some places in the Torah where this word nitzavim is mentioned, how it's understood, and how we transform the nitzavim of chutzpah to a nitzavim of confidence, joyful confidence, because that's really what we're going into Rosh Hashanah with. Think about Rosh Hashanah. I think I shared, you know, on Rosh Hashanah, that's when we always got our new um, clothes. That's when we um, got, uh, we would have nice food. Everyone's talking about what they're making for Rosh Hashanah. This is the time when we're feeling very happy and special and festive. That doesn't really seem to go together with a day of judgment. Unless we are coming from this place of Atem Nitzavim, you are all standing here today. So what is that kind of standing and how is it different from other types of standing that we see? 
One of the key places that we see of the kind of standing that could be very not good is with the story of Korach and the sidekicks of Datan and Abiram. If you go to page 827, and that's in the Parsha of Korach, 827, and I'll give you the chapter in verse. It's verse, let me just give you the chapter first, I'm sorry, 827. Um, bring back to it. 827, and it is at the top of the page. It is chapter 16, verse 27. It's the end of it. This is when they are rebelling against Moshe and against God. And it says, so they got themselves up from near the dwelling of Korach, Datan, and Aviram from all around. That's on the page before. And then it says, Datan and Aviram went out erect at the entrance of their tents with their wives, children, and infants. And it des describes them as Yatsu, they went out, Nitzavim, upright, as place of haughty. It's like, well, we don't want to be like them. They're the ones they get swallowed by the earth because they're so haughty and they are such rebels against Hashem and against Moshe and against Aaron, they are the big troublemakers. So why would we want to do anything like that? This is repeated earlier also in Shemot and Exodus, when the people come to complain against Moshe after Pharaoh makes the work harder when Moshe goes to ask for their liberation. And Pharaoh is like, you, you, you're too lazy, lazy, lazy. I'm making the work harder. And then the people come to complain against Moshe and Aaron. And the word is also Nitzavim. And it says, in fact, that it was Datan and Aviram that were leading that kind of revolt as well, even though it didn't turn into a, a, in, into a revolt. So this word is understood and is associated with people in situations that we are certainly not looking to be any, anywhere at all similar to. It's also mentioned with Goliath, the story of David and Goliath, that Goliath stood mitzavim, that he also stood in this way of, he was berating and belittling and shaming the Jewish people, egging them on to come and fight him until we know that David, King David, who became King David came and killed him. But this was also, this was also another case of, of mitzavim. So what does this have to do with us? So Nitzavim, this idea has to do with the ability to stand firm. And we have to understand that the very quality that can get us into trouble of this haughtiness and arrogance, and I'm doing things my way, that this has a power that we need to harness that when we do things that are averas, we do sins. It says a sin only arises when we are in a place of defiance. We're being defiant. I want to do things my way. That's defiance. And yet, and I, you know, it, it's easy to say this as a grandparent, when you see, you know, little children who are defiant at the age of two or three or whatever it might be, and you say to the parents, this is a great quality because a child who cannot stand up for themselves and is just like putty in the parents' hands, that kid is going to have big problems if they can't stand up and assert their identity. So asserting identity is a very powerful tool that can take us in the wrong direction or the right direction. And before Rosh Hashanah, we are galvanizing that quality to put it in the right direction. And what helps us is when we understand when we understand, hold on one second. Uh, you came back, thank you, yay. Okay, this is when we understand that the rest of that sentence about the Atem Savim had a very important word, and that was Lifne Hashem, that I was, they were standing before Hashem. And when it says, Atem Nitzavim, you are standing Hayom Kulchem, all of you, lifnei Hashem Elokechem, you are standing like at attention and ready to, to do the right thing before Hashem. And instead of being in a place of anti-Hashem, everything that's coming up instead is a place of being, I am ready to serve and I am ready to do things. Uh, oh, so Misty is asking, thank you so much, Misty. It's a great question. Is this related to the Kabbalistic concept of Netzach? Yes, 
Yes, yes, yes. And in fact, you'll notice that they have a letter in common, and that's the letter Tsadi. The letter Tsadi, even how you say it, it's the word of a Tsadi, of a righteous person. It's the word in, it's the letter in the word eights of a tree that is grounded and has deep roots and can stand. It's a very good idea. So something is like something that has netzach, that has endurance, needs to be the same thing of nitzavim. And yet we always say you're not supposed to be you know, like the Jewish people. Is it a compliment or is it a problem when we're told that we are stiff-necked people? It's both. That was actually Moshe's defense to God of the Jewish people. On one hand, it sounds like, oh, you have to forgive them. They're stiff-necked people. What are you going to do with them? They're like, you know, they're so stiff-necked. But he was really saying, Hashem, they are stiff-necked people. You need a people that can endure throughout the centuries. You need, you cannot have like wimpy people. So sometimes that works against you. Again, like a child who's strong-willed. It can work against you if you're the parent trying to get them to do what you want them to do. And then you pray for it. When you send them off to school and to college and out into the world, it's like, I hope they have, they can stick to it and stand up for themselves and that they can persevere because without it, we're goners. So this is a reminder to us of Atem Nitzavim Kolchem Hayom Lifnei Hashem before God. So that when we place ourselves and we are steadying ourselves and we see Hashem, that is in, in reference to God, I am Nitzavim. When I am going to be Nitzavim in front of me and my will and my ego, and then that's liable to get me into a whole lot of trouble. In fact, that's probably how I got into trouble to begin with, is because I was dafka about what I wanted to do instead of what Hashem wants from me. So this power of this is a joyful, borderline chutzpah, but good. This is good. And so this would come into Rosh Hashanah, and this gives us tremendous happiness because it means we are really ready it's like having a, you know, a, an armed force or something that is strong and sturdy and ready to serve. You don't need, I mean, and in fact, that's why it, part of it is like in the drills that they have. I remember learning when we went to the Air Force Academy that when the cadets are walking, they have to walk a certain way. They can't be just kind of like schlepping around. They have to walk a certain way. And if a, if a person of a higher level comes past them, they have to stop or salute or do it. I don't know, whatever it is they have to do to show that they are ready and at attention and at ease. So we see any time that we have a force mobilized for action involves the physical act of standing at attention. Nobody says like to be schlepping around. So Rosh Hashanah is a time when we are at attention, atem nitzavim, hayom kulchem, all of you together before Hashem. So says, this is Rosh Hashanah. We come to God and we say, I'm ready to serve. I'm celebrating. I'm wearing a beautiful outfit. I'm singing. We don't sing Hallel. Okay, we don't go that far because Hallel is for the other holidays. So we do have some trepidation. It is the day of judgment but we are tilted to the side of joy. We are tilted to the side of happiness. We are tilted to the side of confidence. It says, and this isn't only for Rosh Hashanah. It says, this should accompany us all year round. The entire year, when we make a mistake, it says, I think enough of myself to just get up. Because to be in a place of despair, we've talked about this before, despair is not an option. That when we despair, says that is the, the work of the Yetzer Hara. It is the work of the evil inclination to put us in a place of, ugh, oh, you know, who do you think you are? You've done so poorly. You're so not great. You have so much to go. You think you can really do anything. You're, you're worthless. It says that place of despair says that is the work of the Yetzer Hara. We have a reference to that, both to its opposite as well as to that. So the Haftorah for this Shabbos is on page, page 1202 in this book. 
and it comes, it's the final Haftorah of Consolation. Starting from Tisha B'Av, we had seven Haftorahs of Consolation, and this is the final one. This is the final day, and the, the opening words of it are, you would think would be, get ready to repent, you sinners, but that's not what it says. It says, in fact, it says, I will rejoice intensely with Hashem. And the Hebrew is, Sos asis Bashem, tagel nafshi, my soul shall exult with my, exult with my God, for he has dressed me in the raiment of salvation, in a robe of righteousness has he cloaked me, like a bridegroom who dons priestly glory, like a bride who bedecks herself in her jewelry. For as the earth brings forth her growth, and as a garden causes its sowings to grow, so shall my Lord Hashem Elohim cause righteousness and praise to grow in the face of all nations. That's the mood of this final Haftorah. It's like, it's like a wedding. This is like Gila, Rina. This is like joy, happiness, and I'm exulting because I am with my most intimate one that we've been saying all during the month of Elul. Anila Dodi Vadodi Li, I am to my beloved, and my beloved is to me, and now I am rejoicing. That's how I'm going into Rosh Hashanah, is I am rejoicing. And we have like a little wedding meal, you know, we have our Sauda, our meal, our Rosh Hashanah meal, and we have all the different signs for a good year. We don't do that for any other holiday. We don't have signs of like that should be a, a good Hanukkah. I mean, we have Hanukkah Gel, but that's a tradition for giving a gift. But Rosh Hashanah is like apples and honey. And there's a whole list. We talked about these, these simanim, these signs. Everything is good and happy and sweet. Some people make it, are very, very careful. I'm not in this category. Some people are very, very careful to not serve any food that's sour. Not even anything that would make your mouth pucker. Because everything should be sweet for Rosh Hashanah because you're so happy and it should be a good year and you want only the signs for something good and sweet. People refrain from eating nuts. Again, I don't. But some people do because the gematria, the numerical equivalent of the word for nut, was, which is egos, is the same as for chait, which is sin. So someone says, I don't stay away from nuts. I stay away from sin. That's my, that's my, that's my good omen. I, that's my sign. I stay away from sin instead of staying away from nuts. But it gives us an idea of the extent that people go to to make this so joyful and to stay so much on the side of tipping things on the pot to the positive place. I don't even want my mouth to pucker. I don't want to even eat something that has a gematria of sin. I'm like so in a place of happiness and joy and rejoicing with God because this is the beginning of my new, my recreation. I am being recreated. So people are always looking for the fountain of youth. People want eternality. The best way to have eternality is to connect with that which is eternal, which is God. So that's what we're doing for Rosh Hashanah. That's what we're celebrating when we say that God is the king. God is Melech, the crown sovereign. We're saying, I, I'm riding on the coattails of eternality, not on the coattails of things that are finite, not things that are finite. So another connection to the ideas of things that are infinite relates to the shofar. And again, I, I know I keep saying this, every year I learn something, something more. What do you learn about the shofar? It has so much to teach us, so much to teach us. But this is about how the sound is made. The sound is made by breath. There's, there's no keys on it, there's nothing like that. It's all breath. And this is the breath of creation. So where did the breath come from? When Adam Harishon, when the first person was created, the breath was the divine breath of God. We're celebrating on Rosh Hashanah that we want to be re-enlivened, that we want the breath to animate us that is the breath of Hashem, that that's the kind of neshima, it's called breath, related to the word neshama, and that our breath should be the breath of God. So if our breath is the breath of God, if what God breathed into me, God's breath, then what happened to it? What happens when I'm breathing in and out? Is that still God's breath? Or did that initial breath go out? 
It says, you know, the first breath that went in was the soul and it stays with us as long as we're alive. That being said, every breath we take is supposed to be a reflection of that breath. So we breathe, we breathe in, we breathe out. So it says, kol hanishama tehalel ya. All of the souls will, will praise you, God. But it can also be understand with every breath. So think about when you say like with every breath I take, and you can fill in the poetic you know, conclusion to that sense. With every breath I take, with every breath I take, I do what? I think of you, Hashem. With every breath I take, I'm focused on the spiritual eternality of the things that I do and the consequences of my actions. With every breath, think about the breath that a person takes with singing or the breath we take in order to be able to speak. So basically, speech is breath. Speech is breath as it comes through the throat and the mouth and the whole package we have here in our face. But speech is breath, is directed breath. Which means that if we are using our speech in a way that is counter what our neshama demands of us, we are literally wasting our breath and we are going against what our breath was given to us to do. So on Rosh Hashanah, we're going to have the breathy instrument of the shofar. And that's going to sig signal and symbolize and signify being re-breathed into like, I ran out of breath and perhaps I did. Perhaps we did. Maybe we used our breath in the wrong way throughout this past year and we need to have new life and people talk about that. There was new life breathed into the project, right? What does that mean? It means a new energy, a new spirit. So Rosh Hashanah, you can just picture that shofar is like God literally breathing into each one of us, the soul of life, once again for a new year. I think a lot of us are out of breath. It's been a challenging year. We need to be re-ensouled and re-breathed into and we will stand at attention, and we stand during the shofar reading. Okay, we don't sit like all huddled up. We stand up. It's like, okay, Hashem, breathe it into me. Give me this new life. Give me a new life for a new year. Take all the things that I have and my ability to be strong and make it be strong for the good things. Make me be strong so that I know that I can have faith and confidence in myself to change myself, to grow myself, to continue on in the face of so many challenges and so many obstacles that come in my way, give me the strength to do that. And for that, I need to be standing. I need to be nitzavim. Another word for standing, as we said, is lakum. Um, like kama, kuma means to, koma means to stand up, uh, to be standing. What's really interesting is that Koma is spelled kuf, vav, mem, he. Interestingly, those are the same letters as the word mikvah. Now in the word koma, kuma, the vav is used as a vowel, which those of us who are learning Hebrew know that the vav can be either a vowel or it can be the V sound. So in the word mikvah, mem, kuf, vav, he, then it becomes a V sound. It says, when the person goes into a mikvah and then they come out, they come out as a new person. But what does a mikvah do? It says in a mikvah, you have to strip down, okay? Nothing, no barriers. You have to let it all go. Let it, take it all off. Let it go. You immerse in the mikvah, which basically could kill you if you stayed in there because you have to be completely immersed in the water. Now, human beings can't breathe in water. We're not fish. So in a way, the mikvah is a place of both death and life. If you were to stay in there, it's not really a place to live. It's a place of transition from one thing to another. But you have to go through an almost mini death experience, which is you need to immerse in the water, which could end your life in order to then stand up and start a new one. So you go into the mikvah, 
and you let go and you come out and you stand up and you are re and sold in that way again. This is why people have a custom of going to the mikvah before Rosh Hashanah, before Yom Kippur for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not obligated, but many people have that tradition because that's what we're doing. But the holiday itself is like a mikvah because what do you do in a mikvah? It says that it's like you're a new baby. So the custom is to kind of crouch down, like to go into almost like a fetal position and then stand up so that you are born again. So we were the original been born again. It's like every mix experience is a born again experience, but it requires letting go. And it's the letting go that's hard. When we let go of our actions, it's like taking off our clothes. These averas, these sins don't really define me. They're not me. I'm taking them off. I'm letting it go and I'm immersing myself in the reality of God. And once I do that, then I can stand up and become a new person who is stronger. But I don't know, I guess it's like, you know, I remember I took swimming lessons. I was so bad at it, but I remember I was being on the diving board and I was petrified. And the, the instructor, I don't recommend this at all. It was horrible. He pushed me off. He pushed me off the diving board. It took me many years to get over that. I would never let anybody anywhere near me if I was on a diving board. It took me actually a long time to actually learn how to dive. So I'm so scared. And yet, if he would have left me there, I probably would still be standing there right now because I didn't have the courage to step away. And I'm not sure what I thought was going to happen. I saw everybody else stepping off and they were fine, but I was too scared. So there is something about letting go that freaks us out. If I let go of a behavior, even one that I don't like, it still defines me in my little twisted mind. And so it's hard to step away because I don't know what's on the other side. I don't know what's on the other side. That water, it looked really scary from up those few feet. I don't know what's gonna happen. And sometimes that's what we face. It says we need to have some sturdiness and steadiness and confidence and chutzpah. You know, there's always the kid who's willing to be the first one off. I remember there was, there were, there was a kid in our daughter's school who jumped off the roof of the school. I'm like, who does that? Who does that? Well, he later served in the Israeli army and did all sorts of other brave, heroic things. Now, they wouldn't be asking me to do any of that. I'm not jumping off a building. I'm not doing anything. I'm not going out in, dark, in the dark to the alley. So there has to be a something in us that gives us the courage and the fortitude to stick with it, to try again, and to move into places that are not totally known. And that's called Nitzavim. But our comfort is Atem Nitzavim Hayom today on Rosh Hashanah. Kulchem, all of you, Lifnei Hashem. I'm God. Because what makes a difference jumping in? I don't know if anyone remembers. There's a very big difference jumping into the water by yourself and jumping to a parent or a friend or a teacher who was there to catch you. It's different if you jump out of a window. God forbid there's a fire. Jumping to the pavement versus jumping into the firefighters holding the thing to catch you. When we know that we are before Hashem and Hashem is there to catch us and hold us and help us, it makes the journey much easier and much less scary. So this is the attitude that we want to have is you're all here. You're all here and I'm here. You're Lifnei Hashem. I'm with you. I'm going to catch you. So step off and go into this new place and this new direction and this new creation. You can do it and we can keep growing and changing and developing and flourishing for the coming year. So that's what I wanted to share with you. I want it. happy to hear any questions you have about the shofar, Rosh Hashanah, Nitzavim, why we need a little bit of chutzpah. Um, this is something that keeps us and you might have stories of yourself where you know like, my chutzpah like actually saw me through. I was able to persevere and have confidence in myself when either other people or other situations or something were standing in my way. If anybody wants to share anything, they're welcome to. Just unmute yourself. I will hopefully see you. Beth Ann, are you trying to do that? Okay, can you un... Okay, I did you it. All right. You did it. All right, you stuck with it. <laughs> I, I want... I. Well, we were learning, I, you know, two, um, two images or related thoughts came to my mind. This idea of this calm confidence, it's kind of, 
it's kind of a unusual example, but there's this dog trainer called the uh, Caesar Milan who takes these insane dogs and and just through his body language basically gets them <laughs> calmed down and he calls it calm assertive energy. I and love that. I, I do too. <laughs> I do too. I do too. So it's funny where you find tour in the world, you know. You know, Bethany, but... I love you said that, and I love that definition of calm, assertive energy. And yes. I think that's what this is. It, it is right. um, that is what, and you know, you can call it confidence, but I like it more specifically defined like that of calm, assertive energy, and it is yes. an energy, and it is projected, and. And the dog can tell, it's like why I was a terrible horseback rider is the horse knew I knew nothing. First of all, my horse was always named Gladys and always wanted to go off the trail and eat grass. That's <laughs> my horses did. And the leader of the group was like, no, you have to let it know that you're in charge. It's like, but I'm not, but and I'm, not. Like, <laughs> I'm not. So it says that our, so it's a really good metaphor whether it's a dog or a horse. It says, because that's the relationship between our body and our soul. It yeah. says the, our body is the horse and our soul is the rider or our body is the dog and the soul is the owner. And it's, there's going to be questions like who's in charge here? And that the yeah. neshama, the soul, the master of this body, me, Ellen, has to be in charge of my body. And if I don't have this, what, what did you say? Calm assertive energy Calm, assertive of energy the body just goes and does whatever it wants it's like i can see you're not in charge it's like when the teacher leaves the room you know what's going to happen it's a <laughs> natural process um there was actually a story about a rabbi uh or maybe it's i don't know it's a rabbi he no business person who had hired a, a wagon and a driver to take him someplace and the uh, the the business person said, like, you know, it's really important that I get there on time. And he had his lunch and then he fell asleep, but so did the wagon driver. He fell asleep. The horses went off and they went off the road and the wagon tipped over and the business person woke up. And he's like, what are you doing? He said, oh, I, he said, you fell asleep. He said, well, my horses are very smart and I, and I, I trusted them to be able to, you know, keep on going on the path. It's like, no, because a well-trained horse is a horse, you know, it's not yeah. a person and you can't do that. So it's like, it's like leaving where they say the fox in charge of the hen house. It's like, yeah. oh, it's a very well-trained fox. I never saw him do anything. It's like, <laughs> I'm sorry. So it's a fox. <laughs> so part of it is also having a, mm. I think it's kind of humorous. We have to have a humorous understanding mm -hmm. of who we are. And we need to know that our body is kind of like a little toddler. It might be like, it may be well-aged, but it really is kind of like really wants to do its own thing. And that if there's nobody who is in charge, then it's just going to do its own thing. So, you know, we can even understand that even in, on a given day, even on a given day, in the morning, we start off, you know, if we're well-rested, and we're in charge, I know what I want and my goals and blah, blah, blah. And then as I go on from the day and I get start getting tired and it's like, uh, then who knows? People people don't eat cartons of ice cream usually at 9.30 in the morning. They eat it at 9.30 at night. It's like, why right. is that? It's the same person who was in charge at 9.30 in the yeah. morning. It's 9.30 at night. And like, no, actually she's not there anymore. That willpower <laughs> is spent. Mm -hmm. And so like nobody's in charge and the horse goes off the path. So when we understand that, that that's the equation, then we can have, again, it, it shouldn't be like, oh my gosh, the body's terrible. It's like, no, the body's funny because a horse can really take you far. I think that business person, if he was walking to his destination, he'd be walking for a year. When the driver drives the horses, then you can get to your destination. So we need the body. It has incredible strength and power and gifts and talents. It just needs to be under our rule. So at the same time that we are crowning God King on Rosh Hashanah, to some extent, we are also crowning ourselves Queens. Mm. It's like, who's in charge? Okay. I'm going to say God is in charge. Okay. God is in charge, but I'm God's child. So I'm like the princess. That means I'm in charge also. 
I'm in charge of my own individual kingdom of my body and myself, my life and my choices. I want to do it in concert with the ultimate crown sovereign of the universe, but somebody needs to be in charge because God's not running my individual life and my individual choices. I am. So we need to be standing at attention. This coronation is a coronation of ourselves as well. So when we get to a place where I am also coronating myself as a uh, part of God's kingdom, it's as if I've been deputized. I'm deputizing myself to be in that, or God, I should say, is deputizing us, which is what he did at creation. When he created Adam, when he created humanity, he said, I'm creating you, but sell him Elohim. I'm creating you in my image. What does that mean? And let us create man means we are creating you together. And that means you need to do something. It can't just be on autopilot. It's not going to work. The horse goes off the trail. So when we are in charge, so we coordinate ourselves, we coordinate Hashem. And that's how we bring God's kingdom to full manifestation in this world. And God willing, it should happen this year in 5782. And uh, each of us should be blessed in our own castles. Uh, a woman's home is her castle. In our own castles of our homes, our communities, our families, our own personal space, just me, myself, and I. Of Because um, it's like we're never, we are never alone. We are always in charge of ourselves. And what we do as individuals in our relationships with other people matters tremendously because God has deputized, has deputized us that we are god's children and not just like in a hallmark card kind of god's children yeah. god, god is counting on us and that's why when moshe defends the jewish people to god and he says they're a stiff-necked people and that stiff-neckedness is you need them to be like that because they cannot serve you or your purposes unless they have that attempt nitzavim unless they have that peace in them so our challenge is just to make sure it's channeled in the right direction. We do not want to get rid of it. We don't want to be Datan and Aviram. We want to channel it and be the people who are standing on the end, end of Moshe's life. Can you imagine if they were not with that powerful sense that they would just, I don't know, they would have just melted then. What do we do? What are we going to do? Moshe's dying. It's not going to work. It's terrible. They would have been, they would have fallen apart. It's like the Jewish people cannot fall apart as a group, nor as individuals. So each one of us is essential, an essential worker in this plan. Each of us is an essential worker, which is why we all attend the coronation. We all attend the coronation. So I hope that everybody will have a wonderful and meaningful Rosh Hashanah. When we meet next Thursday, God willing, 5782, it will be a fast day. It'll be Tzom Gedalia. It'll be the fast of Gedalia, but we will meet. And um, I will look forward to seeing everybody. I just want to wish you and your families and everybody, first of all, a year of health. And it should be a year of inspiration. And that people, I think, are feeling drained and worn out. And Rosh Hashanah should re ensoul and re-enliven each and every one of us and all of humanity so that we are prepared with the strength, the fortitude, the calm, assertive energy that the world requires, that each of us require in our own personal lives, that our communities require, that the world requires to go to the next place in God's plan. So I want to just wish you all a Lashana Tova. You should have a good, happy, healthy, sweet year, you and everyone in your family. And I'll look forward to seeing you. First thing, 5782. And I wish the same for you too. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Ellen, yes. for a beautiful sheer. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you for joining yeah, me. I'm so glad that you came back to on my everyone. Screen, so I wasn't just talking to an ad. Really weird. So, and thank you again to those of you who joined me for the radio show last week. I was, uh, I really appreciated it. It was, it was fun to do, and um, it was interesting talking, speaking to an audience of mixed Jewish and non-Jewish people, and uh, it was fun. So, is, is it recording? It was recorded. I can send you a recording. I have a link for it. It's a audio. To, it's visual. It's a video also. So I'm happy to send you the.
the link. I'll send it out to everybody. Anyone who wants to listen to it can. Yeah. And this, the other that. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. I will hopefully together. see you before yeah. then. But I, I mean, good, been good planning and planning, and now it's two weeks from two weeks. <laughs> So yes. Good luck with the bird uh, for Dahlia. I'm sorry, Gabby. Good luck. Good luck with the Leida with the birds. Amen. Thank you so much. It should all be Bishaa Tova. Uh, amen, amen, amen. They're excited. They keep us posted, okay? Keep us I posted. I will keep you all posted. Yes. All right. Thank you so her. much. Shana Tova to you and to everyone. Shana Tova. Thank you. Be well, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.